Thank you. Um, so Mick and I are going to sort of tag team the keynote. I'll speak for a little bit, and Mick will cover a whole bunch of neat stuff, and then um, we'll do some, some addition. And the, Mick will have some live screen reader demo at some point, and uh, I'll tackle some other accessibility issues and do some sort of tr attempt some, some live uh, fixing of some basic accessibility issues that are pretty common across most uh, websites. In this case, I'm going to actually pick on the... PHP conference website, um, but that's not, um, <clears throat> I could have picked any website, this is just one that we'll all be familiar with, right? Um, so to begin, uh, web accessibility, really to define it, it's simply about ensuring that web content, web interactions are accessible, usable by people with disabilities. And when I think about web accessibility, I tend to think of it more in terms of a broader social imperative, if you will, to include everybody, to make sure that the web content can be used by everybody, um, regardless of disability, um, and regardless of the technology that they might be using. At which point we're really talking about inclusive design or universal design, which <clears throat> certainly broadens the scope somewhat, but it gets us thinking about all the different types of people, all the different types of modalities and interactions, um, that people are going to have the types of devices that they're using that they're going to be coming to your website with. Um, and that is a broad range of people. In terms of, of disabilities, um, there's quite a, a number that web accessibility addresses. Uh, there's people with sensory disabilities, so vision impairments, for example. Um, probably blindness is the most um, obviously a uh, tricky one to handle, or it's the one that comes to mind when we think about web accessibility, because for most people, the web is really a highly visual medium, and so you wonder how can a blind person interact with the web? We'll see some of that later. Um, but it's important to note that uh, blind people are actually a very, very small number of those with vision impairments, and, and by far uh, and large a way, the, the number of people with vision impairments uh, just have low vision is much greater. So most people with vision impairment just have low vision of some degree. And then there's a range of people that have uh, different types of color blindness as well. So um, web accessibility has ways of addressing all those. Uh, hearing impairments, again, uh, deaf people, those people that rely on sign language or lip reading, um, that's a small proportion of the people who have hearing impairments. The vast majority are hard of hearing to some degree or another. Uh, another impairment is tinnitus. That's sort of just a high-pitched ringing in the ear, um, and that can be very, um, that can be very frustrating, distracting um, from day-to-day -day activity. Certainly, parsing information, reading. Um, and then we move into the physical impairment area, and again, a broad range here of physical impairments. Um, a subset, I would say, really affect people's ability to use the web, and that's uh, motor impairments. So uh, inability to interact with a computer in the more conventional ways, which is basically using a mouse or even using a keyboard. Um, so people with arthritis, cerebral palsy, uh, MS, Parkinson's, uh, various types of paralysis will have... Uh, will be presented with barriers when they're trying to interact with typical computer uh, technology. And so they have additional devices and forms of input that they use to, to surpass those barriers. On the cognitive or neurological front, um, this is going to affect um, uh, reading, parsing of information, interacting with information, visual layouts, these sorts of things. So ADD, autism, Down syndrome, dyslexia is a common one. Uh, dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia, but for numbers and maths, uh, and, and learning dis simple learning disabilities, reading disabilities, um, a variety of these cognitive conditions will impact somebody's ability to just read or interact with the information that, that you've put up on your website. And then there are a whole range of other conditions that we don't normally consider disabilities. Uh, simple, I always think it's a kind of a simple irony that even just using a computer day to day results often enough in conditions that impact your ability to use the web. So, you know, how many people here have experienced some degree of RSI, repetitive stress injury, just by using the mouse all the time and you find ways to, to accommodate that? Maybe you change your, <laughs> is that really from that? Ouch, okay. <laughs> a cast, he has a oh. cast on his <laughs> um, Yeah, that would be bad RSI if that were the case. Um, <clears throat> 
But uh, it, it is the case that just, just repetitively using these devices that allow us to interact with the web can, can lead us to uh, suffer these barriers where we have to change the way we interact and, and we become de facto disabled, at least temporarily. Um, even just, you know, going out for a, a binge night of drinking and, drink, and, and trying to parse a website the next morning um, can be similar to having a cognitive impairment. Um, and then there are temporary injuries. You break your mouse hand and um, you find that interacting, you have to find a whole new way to interact with your computer. So that's sort of the, a broad range, give you a sense of the broad range of disabilities that web accessibility addresses. Um, in web accessibility circles, we start to talk a lot more these days about um, people with disabilities and the elderly, because of course, anybody here who's over 40 uh, knows your eyesight starts to go, um, even attention uh, span starts to diminish, and you're starting to suffer conditions that are similar to having a disability. And the number of people who are over 65 or the elderly is increasing everywhere around the world quite drastically. So for example, in New Zealand, the latest uh, 2013 uh, disability survey um, identified about a quarter almost of New Zealanders as having a disability. But notice that the people who are over 65 with a disability number close to 60%. So way more than half of people over 65 have some kind of disability. And that's not even including all of those who don't self-identify as having a disability. For example, again, people with um, some degree of dyslexia or maybe just really low vision um, or, or some degree of, of hearing loss, they won't necessarily consider themselves disabled. But um, for all intents and purposes, when they're interacting with your web content, there's some potential for barriers to be introduced there because of their condition. So uh, note as well, um, in the late 2030s, so not that long from now, a whole quarter of the New Zealand population will be over 65, whereas right now or um, 10 years ago, it was only 12%. I don't know what it is right now. Um, but anyway, that's a huge, huge increase. And, and countries around the world are trying to figure out not only how they're going to deal with uh, pensions and retirees and that sort of thing, but we need to consider um, that, you know, in fact, we're all going to be over 65, touch wood, um, at some point. And so there's a cer certain sense of, of being uh, selfish about accessibility. You're going to want it at some point in your life. So, so let's get onto that now. But really, who cares? Um, there's a number of reasons we might care. Uh, besides those I mentioned, um, there's the stick, we could call it. Um, there's the legislative reasons, the legal reasons. In New Zealand, like in most countries, um, there's anti-discrimination legislation. So, for example, the New Zealand Human Rights Act discriminates against the provision of goods and services on the basis of a disability. It doesn't mention the internet, but the internet is a form in which we provide goods and services. So it applies. And it applies equally to the public sector, so government, as it does to the private sector. Um, most countries have signed, if not also ratified, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which um, adds additional requirements on nations to ensure that citizens have access to information and services. And in this case, it, it does explicitly uh, mention the internet. So there are additional legal requirements that are on part of signatories to that convention, uh, international legal obligations. And, and that's the sort of the stick or the legislative stick. Uh, there are better reasons, the carrot, uh, the business reasons, for example. 24% uh, in New Zealand, let's say worldwide, about 20% of people have disabilities. Even if only 10% of people have a disability that affects their ability to use the web, that's a 10% market um, increase if you're able to cater to those individuals. And that's nothing to shy at. Uh, people with disabilities who come to your website, they'll come back, just like um, any you know, happy customer. If they're able to interact and use your services, they'll come back. So there's, there's some business um, advantages to being accessible. But still, there's a lot of resistance. A lot of business owners say, you know, nobody with a disability comes to my website. Right? And it could just be that your inaccessible website means they can't use it, so they, they don't show up in any of your analytics. Besides that, how do you know if someone has a disability and comes to your website? There's nothing that informs your, your analytics that somebody has a disability, that someone's using a screen reader, that somebody is, um, that has a disability, right? So, so you don't know. Um, just given the pure statistical numbers there of people with disabilities, it's guaranteed that somebody with some kind of disability is coming to your website. 
Um, even if you're selling something that you don't think somebody with a disability could possibly want. For example, if you sell skateboards, um, certainly no blind person rides a skateboard. But, you know, blind people have children, they have families, maybe they're buying a skateboard as a gift, maybe they're, they're reviewing skateboards with, with a child or, or somebody else. So there's all sorts of reasons that people with disabilities will be accessing your services and your business online. For me, one of the nicer things about accessibility is that it enables us to empower um, and enable individuals. And, and Mick is going to talk about that a bit later on in more detail. Um, at a broader level, it enables us to empower and enable society and community by including more people in our day-to-day -day lives, um, by having them participate through communications channels like the web, we get more perspectives applying to our civic discussions, our political discussions. Um, this allows society to increase the potential that it has. Um, and notably, I think, I always find this very interesting, it spurs innovation, everyone's favorite word these days. I'm not sure anybody really knows how to define it, except retroactively, that was innovative. But um, we can do that in this case, uh, for example, in the early 1800s, Pellegrino Turi invented the typewriter. And he invented this typewriter because uh, he had a blind friend and lover um, from whom he wanted to read her love letters. And so to enable her to write legible love letters, um, the typewriter now exists. The late 1800s, Alexander Graham Bell, he was working with helping children who were hard of hearing. And um, as a result of that work, he invented the telephone, ended up inventing the telephone. It's been important. Um, that, in turn, has led to a series of other inventions around speech synthesis, uh, speech recognition, and notably the transistor, which uh, is in each of our little devices that we carry around now. So really important inventions. Uh, you may be familiar with the Good Grips example. It's a range of um, kitchen utensils. These were invented to help people with arthritis, but it turns out Everyone likes using really easy to grasp, easy to use, easy to hold kitchen utensils. And it's now one of the leading brands of kitchen utensils out there. Final example, this individual, Vinton Cerf, uh, you may know him as the inventor of the internet. He's hard of hearing, and he's married to a blind woman, or sorry, a deaf woman. And since the early 70s, they've been communicating with each other through text message from 1972 on, I believe. Um, of course, that ended up becoming email, which he incorporated into ARPANET, the precursor to the internet, and it's because of that trajectory that we have email today in, in the internet. Um, so these examples are something that we refer to as uh, the curb cut effect. Here's a, a version of a, a, an image of a curb cut, that's just the sloping uh, down of sidewalk corners, pathways, um, again, originally invented or implemented in order to support people in wheelchairs, but it turns out everyone from uh, cyclists to skateboarders to people with shopping carts and prams appreciate this. So it has greater benefits than that small range of um, activity that it was initially intended for. And so all of these examples we, we, we refer to as uh, examples of the curb cut effect. Basically you have people trying to overcome barriers presented by disability and they end up inventing something or developing something that basically helps all of us. And so um, I think that, that's an important lesson about web accessibility. But it's not just disabilities. Accessibility is there to address the range of technology, the range of devices that people use, the different cultural and linguistic barriers that people might have. For example, different cultures respond differently to different colors. Uh, they respond differently to different layouts of information, different turns of phrase. Um, the, the image of the VCR there from the early 80s, it was pretty typical that um, when those first came out, um, your parents didn't know how to program them, um, so they relied on their children to program them for them. Um, but that's just a generational issue. And the same thing happens, has been happening with the elderly and computers and smartphones. They slowly get them, but they need a, a helping hand. So there's those sorts of barriers that accessibility helps to address. And I mentioned different devices. So here's a, a range of different assistive technologies. Uh, <clears throat> these are more physical assistive technologies. The top left, there's a head wand, so that someone who can't interact using their hands, and maybe they have a motor impairment or are paralyzed, they can use the head wand to make key presses on a keyboard, for example. 
Um, the bottom left is just a big red button. It's called a switch. It's just a binary switch, on, off, and with the help of additional software, allows somebody with very limited uh, motor capacity to fully interact with and use all the software on a computer. Uh, the top right is uh, a sip and puff device. So again, it's just a variation on a binary switch. Sip and puff, blow and, and, and suck air. And that's a binary switch. And again, with software, you can control the computer. And the bottom right one, I think is the coolest thing. Um, that is a one-handed keyboard. So it's got everything there. It comes actually, that's a right-handed, one-handed keyboard. It comes obviously in, in a left-handed flavor as well. And these are examples of assistive technologies. Um, for people with vision impairments, uh, for example, top left, there's a Braille device. So through software, can output to a Braille device, allows input through the Braille device as well. Um, you can actually have Braille devices, handy little ones that um, work via Bluetooth and your mobile phone. So it connects with your mobile phone, Braille comes out through Bluetooth to the device, and you can actually enter content through the Braille device as well. Um, screen magnifiers, again, obviously, most people with vision impairments, as I mentioned earlier, are having low vision. Um, they're using screen magnifiers. And then there's, uh, they're also using screen readers in some cases, and certainly blind users um, rely on screen readers. And there's, there's a number of those. VoiceOver on the Mac comes with. If you have a Mac, Command F5, uh, not right now. Um, that, that'll open up VoiceOver, and you can play with that. It's got a tutorial to take you through it. On Windows, uh, JAWS is one of the common ones. Uh, Window Eyes is another one. Um, one of my favorites um, is NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Access. And I'll hand over to Mick on that note. OK, thank you. So although I'm totally blind, uh, assistive technologies have helped me access computers in the web uh, and the web for a long time. This allows me to independently read news, do shopping and banking, socialize, and even run a company. I've been running a charity for, also, uh, for the last nine years or so, which has included you know, having to do the accounting and admin and even um, programming as well, because we do software development. The type of assistive technology that I use is a screen reader. And screen readers, as their name suggests, read information off a computer screen, either in synthetic speech or can display it uh, with a, a Braille device. The screen reader that I choose to use is called NVDA, which stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. And using the NVDA screen reader, I'm able to navigate the operating system, open a page in a web browser, and even read the page. Actually, Jason will do a demo anyway later of, of um, when he's fixing up a, a page, and you'll be able to hear a screen reader talking. But, um, the point is that normally, um, well, in fact, I'm reading a, using a screen reader right now to read all my notes, and, and I can read web pages, and as I read, I can read the links on a page, headings, form fields, and um, even, even, you know, everything like uh, th that I need to access on the page. As I say, I can you know, do online shopping, banking, and all those kind of things, use Facebook, WordPress, whatever you like. So NVDA is a, a screen reader, as I said, but for Microsoft Windows. It's both free and open source. Uh, and it's been providing uh, more than 50,000 blind and vision impaired people across the world uh, access to Windows for no more cost than their sighted peers. Um, so uh, NVDA is not the first screen reader around, of course. There are many others, but NVDA is the first real free and open source, fully featured screen reader for, for Windows. NVDA is use, uh, written by users for users. So the two lead developers, James Tay and myself, are both totally blind. And NVDA has increased education and employment for, for blind people. Um, just as an example, you know, more than, at least in Australia, more than 60% of blind and vision impaired people are unemployed, and that's probably the case in many countries. And NVDA is just one step to, to help um, you know, lower, lower this number. We started working on NVDA in 2006 on a purely voluntary basis, but due to its popularity, uh, we created NV Access, which is an Australian-based charity that sources funding for the project. And the website is nvaccess.org. And from there, you can read more about our charity and also download NVDA for free. But of course, we do ask for a donation if you can. Um, 
NVDA is not only good just for the blind, but also for software and web developers. Developers can use NVDA uh, to test their own code to ensure that it's accessible to the blind. So you can just go straight away, download NVDA, test it out with your website, try using it, maybe turn your monitor off or whatever, and see how well you go with um, reading with, with NVDA. And of course, as it's free, there's really, therefore, no excuse to, to not check if your product is accessible. NVDA is also used by companies such as Google, Yahoo, Mozilla, Microsoft, and Adobe, and many of those companies have been supporting the NVDA project over the last nine years or so. There are several features in NVDA also to help developers, such as a speech viewer, so if you don't like listening to the, the speech, you can just bring up a little window and it just shows you what it's uh, exactly speaking. Uh, and also there's a focus highlight add-on you can uh, add to NVDA, which shows you exactly where NVDA is uh, reading, so it sort of highlights the, the point of focus that it's looking at. So although as a blind user I can read many websites by myself, uh, a lot of things actually need to happen for an assistive technology to be able to gather the needed information. So the, the main thing really is that the page author must have used appropriate and semantic markup. So in other words, don't just code your site with style divs. It does not mean anything. Um, the web browser also must provide the assistive technology with access to the web content via what's called an accessibility API, or at very least, raw access to the page's DOM. So what is an accessibility API? Well, it's a standardized API that provides uh, an assistive technology with information uh, about each control in an application or uh, in the entire operating system. Uh, it provides information for each control, such as the name, i.e. its label, the role, so like the type of control, you know, button, link, checkbox, states, such as like on, off, um, invalid, read only, that, uh, checked, that kind of thing. Other optional properties, maybe value, description, and position within a group. Uh, accessibility APIs also should provide standardized access or programmatic access to text content, uh, including the ability to navigate by character, word, and line, locating the system caret, and fetching textual formatting. They also provide access to tables, including row and column navigation, fetching of associated uh, table header cells. And they also have to fire events to alert the assistive technology that a control or subtree of controls have changed in some way and also has to provide programmatic means of uh, interacting with a control, such as clicking or checking a checkbox or selecting a, a list item. Uh, accessibility APIs provide an abstraction so that an assistive technology can use similar logic to access many different applications or the entire operating system. However, it is up to, in the, in the web browser's case, it's up to the web browser to appropriately map from the DOM to an accessibility API. For example, if you have uh, a standard less a tag with a href and in a text saying hello, it might be mapped to the accessibility API such as the name will be hello, the role type will be link, uh, hello will be available as the part of the document's text content, and if it's, if it's a visited link, the visited state will be available in the object, uh, the control states. And also, finally, it should be also uh, possible to click the link or activate the link via the accessibility API as well. There are uh, several accessibility APIs available today, uh, with web browsers supporting zero or more of them to different degrees. Um, some notable ones are iAccessible2, and this was developed by IBM and others in the mid-2000s. It's a very rich and performant API, uh, supported by Firefox, Chrome, and Opera on Windows. Uh, and thanks to the, the, the work between NVDA, iAccessible2, and Mozilla Firefox, uh, NVDA plus Firefox is usually recognized as one of the best web experiences for the blind and even for uh, testing 
as te testing uh, websites, et cetera, as well. It's worth noting that Google even recommends NVDA plus Firefox uh, when a blind person uses Google products. Another API available is ATK. Uh, that's another rich API, but this time uh, for Unix operating systems. Mac OS X also has its own accessibility API as well. And there is Microsoft UI automation. And this is uh, on Windows. This is Microsoft's accessibility API. Very rich, but um, there are a lot of issues in terms of implementation and performance. Um, the Microsoft Edge web browser is only accessible via UI automation, but because it's only recently come out, there's a lot more work that Microsoft still needs to do to make Edge accessible to people with disabilities. The web is becoming increasingly um, more complicated because of things like you know, dynamic content and web applications. And we see that visual styling is used more and more to you know, convey meaning, meaning to sighted people um, but, uh, you know, when, when creating custom or hybrid controls. But that's you know, not really that great for people with disabilities because HTML alone, um, it's not enough for an assistive technology to understand exactly what something is. As I said from before, if you're using styled divs, how can, the accessible, uh, how can the assistive technology really understand that that is a button? It might look like a button, but there's no way that it can prog programmatically tell that it's a button. So then uh, we have a standard uh, which goes in line with, uh, with um, HTML and other web standards, and this is called ARIA, or Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And this is a set of DOM attributes um, which allow the web author to convey uh, certain information such as it controls state or type and also change things like the controls label and things like that. So you can easily just add ARIA attributes to your existing web code. Uh, so say, for instance, you have a style div which looks like a button, well then you'll add a role of, of button to that to tell the assistive technology that that's what it is. However, it only really conveys information. It doesn't tell the web browser to do any special keyboard or focus handling code. So you still have to do a lot of that, that legwork yourself self as, a, as a web author. Um, so as I said, uh, an example there is if you've got a style div, make it, uh, it looks like a button, just add role equals quote button quote and that will convey that. Um, there are a few other, there, look there are probably hundreds of ARIA properties and things available. Um, you know, when you're bored one day go read the whole ARIA spec, it's wonderful. Um, but it is really useful, but um, it's just some of them worth noting. Uh, ARIA-checked, which you might want to add this to a checkbox or a radio button when the checkbox or radio button is checked to, to actually tell the assistive technology it's on. ARIA-selected, uh, or ARIA-selected, it's, uh, you know, for a list item or a tab, in a tab control, that's the currently selected item. You might want to add that to, to that element. Um, ARIA-expanded, this is for tree view items to say whether they're expanded or collapsed or sometimes they may even be used on tabs in tab controls, so I've noticed. Um, ARIA-hidden as well is a useful way to hide certain presentational content which is completely irrelevant to the assistive technology but just makes the site look pretty. Um, but it may confuse assistive technologies or the users, so you may want to add ARIA-hidden to those elements, but please use it very wisely. Uh, and a useful tip, um, as ARIA is needed really these days for accessibility anyway, well, why not match your CSS rules on the ARIA rather than uh, inventing separate classes? So as, as an example, uh, if you've made a custom radio button and you know, it has a particular style when it's checked and you might have, a, you might have done it with a CSS, uh, sorry, with an HTML class of, I don't know, dot radio button dash checked or something. Well, since you're gonna be adding ARIA to it anyway, you'll be adding a, a role, a role equals quote radio quote and ARIA dash checked equals quote true quote when, uh, when it's checked. Well, you can actually match your CSS rules on that using attribute selectors. And that stops you from having to duplicate uh, you know, log logic in, in two places. Um, finally, just before I hand back to Jason, I'm going to be here for the next 
two days, so please, if you have any accessibility questions or whatever, come up and, and say hello to me. And yeah, great to visit. Expect. So Mick covered in particular ARIA, and that's one way that we can, um, specific way that we can address uh, accessibility concerns, but particularly with interactive components, widgets. ARIA has a range of uh, attributes that relate to document structure as well, for example, landmarks, um, navigation main, for example. Um, but generally, you know, how, how can we otherwise um, make sure that our websites are accessible? And one way, um, the way I would suggest is that you use open standards, of course, and you know that the web is built on open standards. The open web platform is just a collection of these. And there's this famous, well, within accessibility circles anyway, quote from Tim Berners-Lee, the power of the web is in its universality, access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. Um, from its very inception, the web was to be accessible to everyone, regardless of ability, disability, the technology. That's the whole point of HTML. It's machine readable. You can present it in different ways. The same semantics can be delivered in different fashions to different people uh, based on how they perceive. Um, HTML, you know, CSS, SVG, ARIA, um, XML, RDF, all of these come out of the W3C, and the W3C ensures that these technologies enable accessible design and development. So, work with those. Uh, a particular specification that the W3C puts out is called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. Um, it's in current version 2.0. It came out at the end of 2008. So there's current work right now. The working group has just been rechartered. They're going to be looking at adding extensions to this specification to address things like um, uh, cognitive disabilities, which aren't very well covered in the, that existing WCAG. Uh, mobile devices, uh, of course, touch screens have a different interaction pattern than uh, keyboard or the traditional desktop interaction with, with mouse or keyboard. Um, so they're going to address those. There's four core principles, the poor principles, um, in the WCAG success criteria or requirements. And these just require that um, all web content and interaction be perceivable, regardless of how you're perceiving that stuff. So, you know, if you're coming through a different perceptual modality, maybe you can't see, uh, maybe you don't use a mouse, uh, you're going to need to operate that stuff. So, perceivable, operable, understandable, uh, perhaps you have cognitive difficulty, you need to be able to understand how to navigate through a site, how to understand the layout and the content on the page, um, and robust. It needs to be able to work across different devices, different user agents. Um, and, and sort of almost be future-proofed, right? Um, and so for those reasons, uh, we have a, a range of best practices. Uh, progressive enhancement is still uh, the ideal approach, in my opinion. Um, so, of course, you know, that's largely starting with semantic, basic semantic structure that works. It's the core content and functionality. And then progressively add features, um, enhancements, stylistic through CSS, uh, behavioral uh, through, through scripting. Um, responsive web design, mobile first design, these basic, basic best practices really go a long way to supporting accessibility. In the New Zealand government context, as is uh, the same in, in most other government contexts, uh, with the exception of the United States currently, although that's changing, um, WCAG 2 level AA compliance is the common universal um, accessibility standard, basically, that all of the different jurisdictions refer to. Um, the New Zealand government is no different. So we have our web accessibility standard, requires uh, compliance with all level A and level AA, WCAG 2 success criteria. Last year, New Zealand government agencies, uh, they self-assessed their a portion, a sample of their websites against the web accessibility standard. And it was no surprise, in some ways, the results. They identified uh, a range of top accessibility issues that were common across all government websites. These are common across most websites. Um, and these have to do with um, the provision of non-text content for, um, so images, basically. They must have text alternatives. Info and relationships, 131, things that you present visually, you need to make sure any information and relationships, structural information and relationships that you present visually, you present programmatically as well. So that's what you know, markup is for. Um, so you have a heading, you use a heading element. You don't just make a div 
bigger and, and uh, bolder, uh, as, as Mick was suggesting. Um, color contrast, you have to have minimum contrast. So light gray on a dark gray background most often won't really work for a lot of people. Again, over 40s. Um, visible focus. People who rely on a keyboard to tab around a website, they need to know where the focus, keyboard focus currently is. So you have to make that visible focus indicator clear. And name, role, and value. And this touches on the stuff that, that Mick was talking about, um, making sure that name, role, state, um, and other values are programmatically available when you, when you have interactive widgets. And I'm going to go through some examples of these in the next five, ten minutes. Um, and looking at the PHP conference site, again, just chose one site at random. And um, I won't go through all of these again because most people here, I imagine, are more on the developer side than the visual design side. Um, I, I'll, I won't really focus on color contrast. Um, and again, because you're not content authors, I suspect, um, I, won't, I won't talk about uh, non-text content as well, uh, unless we have a chance at the end. Um, what I'll do instead is focus on, on the three that are more um, developer-oriented. Well, in fact, maybe I'll start with um, focus visible. So the actual wording is any keyboard operable. User interface has a mode of operation where the keyboard focus is visible. So let's go here. Um, and I'll just close that for now. So easy way, you should always test this. Always, every single website you built. Um, put your focus in the address bar and then just start tabbing through. And so, you know, we tabbed, went into the search box in the browser, Chrome, and now I'm into the web page. Where's focus? Well, you can probably guess it focuses on this link here because it's probably the same thing, but the, the first thing in the page, but you don't really know. And now I tabbed again, where's focus? I'm tabbing. You know, I have no idea what, oh, I've moved down the page. So I'm probably on the register now button. Um, now I'm probably on this link down here in the bottom left. So, you know, Again, I'm not picking on uh, the conference organizers. Uh, this, is, this is common. And this actually, um, you find this sort of thing um, in a lot of common um, frameworks. So Bootstrap, for example, earlier versions, I think it's been fixed in the latest, um, set outline to none on, on links, right? Or at least in their focus state because designers hate the gray dotted border outline of, around links. Um, but that's there for a purpose. You know, it's there by default in browsers so that people who can't uh, use a mouse but are sighted can see where they are on the page. Um, so, you know, there's, we can see this, for example, if we just, um, here we want a link. Um, there, outline medium none, right? Um, we'll just turn that off. Um, but there's another issue here. And um, if I look at the actual focus style set for that thing, for links, um, there we have it again. Outline medium none on focus, right? Can you see that? Close enough. So what we'll do is we'll just change that. I'm not saying that two pixel solid red is what you want to have as your focus indicator, but you'll see um, that, if we've done this correctly, huh, I know exactly, well, see, there, that's, that's a common issue you have, right? And so they say, oh, damn it, I'm gonna turn that, just turn my outline off. The fix for that, overflow hidden, right? Just set your links to overflow hidden, and now, no problem, I can see exactly where I am on the page. When I focus through, um, everything is, get clear highlights, right? Easy fix makes a huge difference if you don't rely on it. And developers, I'm always surprised that this happens because it's my understanding that developers spend a lot of time with their hands on the keyboard and not going back and forth from the mouse. I'm sure a lot of you do. And um, so, you know, you, you should find it a, a problem when you're trying to navigate a website. Uh, and that sort of thing would stand out, I would suspect. At any point, I would really recommend that this be one thing that you ensure happens. You can get rid of the dotted outline, just replace it with something else. That's no problem. And there are all sorts of ways to make it really clear and obvious um, that where keyboard focus is set. So always do that. 1.3.1, Info and Relationships. As I noted, you want to make sure that all the information and structure in the web page is, uh, that's presented visually 
is available programmatically so that you're using HTML semantic markup properly and enabling those relationships and information, uh, those structural relationships to be provided th through software, as it were. So let's look at another example. Let's look at the um, talks page. Scroll down there. So visually, you know, it's really clear here that Dustin Whittle is going to talk about modern front-end engineering. The, the, the relationship of the image on the left and the caption, Dustin's name, next to the um, text, the body of the um, talk, tells us that you know, um, these things are related. But, for example, um, let's disable this styles and just see what this looks like. That was me. Ah. Um, <laughs> And we get some weird effect there. Um, I wonder if I can show you that a different way. What I'm trying to point out is that, in fact, Dustin Whittle, the image, and the name there come before this heading in the structure. Right? So um, what happens programmatically, um, a heading means I'm the heading for all the content that follows it. Right. So what follows the modern front-end engineering heading is Ben, Ben in this picture. Right. So if I was looking at this structurally, if I wasn't looking at the content on the page, if I was going from the source order, I have a talk called Modern Front-End Engineering, there's the description of it, and then I have the name of the speaker. So I get confused about who is actually responsible for which talk. Um, what you would want to do I mean, you can do this with CSS. That's the power of the web, right? You could have the heading and then have the image and the, uh, the speaker's name and then the, the, the description of the talk in that order. Nice compartmentalize the relationship there between the heading, the talk, and the speaker. Because right now, it's in, an, it's in the reverse order. If I am navigating by heading, screen readers often navigate by heading. They go from heading to heading. They're going to jump from... Um, um, talk title, and then to talk title, and then they'll just start reading after the talk title, figuring that everything that comes after that is about that talk title, and they'll get informed about the speaker, in this case incorrectly, um, that is delivering that. So that's one example. It's not possibly the best, but it's an example of how um, the visual presentation of that relationship is not provided programmatically. And I'll probably stop with this one, 4.1.2. Um, and, and admittedly, 1.3.1, the one I just showed you, and 4.1.2 are the, the most complicated ones um, because they're the ones that really involve the technology underneath it, um, you know, providing, making sure you have a text equivalent for an image. Um, it may seem like a no-brainer, um, but um, dealing with the, 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 the mechanics of browsers, how they work, how they interact with assistive technologies and accessibility APIs takes a little bit more um, technical understanding. And so these, it's, it's understood that, that these are the more complicated ones. Um, but again, um, these are the things that, that particularly developers need to be aware of. So for all user interface components, um, you want to make sure that the name and role can be programmatically determined, that states, properties, and values can be programmatically set, and that notification of changes to these um, settings or values or properties are made available. So we're going to look at an example um, here. And so I've zoomed in a little bit so that we can get the, the mobile view, if you will. Um, and again, um, in this case, we have this mobile link here, which when you activate it, menu drawer comes out from the right. And, and that's fine. So um, we're going to take a quick listen to how this, I've moved into Safari because that works best with voiceover. We're going to take a quick listen to how this Voice works. Voiceover on Safari. News 2015, share button, show all tabs button. So you can see where the focus is. I'm still in the Chrome. I'm going to jump into the web page. Leaving toolbar, so link, image, New Zealand PHP conference. Cool. Well lit, crisp. Okay, that's the description that VoiceOver adds. It tries to be helpful and describe the characteristics of the images. Um, let's just disregard that. Um, so you hear this, I find it, I have yet figured out how to turn it off. Um, Fortunately, in my case, I don't rely on a screen reader. Um, the, this is well done. So, you know, link, image, 
New Zealand PHP conference. Really well done. That means the alt attribute on the image is New Zealand PHP conference. That's cool. It's perfect what it is. That's what the image is. That's what the image says. And it's in a link. Um, so that's great. This is a link to the New Zealand PHP conference website. And that's exactly what it is. Um, note the border here. That's something that the, the focus indicator. That's something that, that voiceover adds. So that's not in the page. Next, we'll move to the next control. Internal link slash. Internal link slash. OK. So presumably, that's a link to the root, the web root, right? Um, well, it's a link. Let's just click it, see what happens. I have no idea if anything's happened at all. Well, I'm used to websites um, often being kind of crap in this way. So I will, presumably, something has been added after. Maybe something has been injected to the page after the link, right? That's where it would be. So I'll just keep tabbing. Link B. Oh. <laughs> no, link A. I don't know Blank seven. what's going on. <laughs> blank, blank, the internal blank. So I'm just, slash. I'm shift tabbing, right? So I'm back to that link again. Well, maybe for some reason it injected some content above this link. Well, let's ta shift tab back up. Link image, New Zealand PHP conference. Well, that was the first item on the page that we found before. So I'll just, well, maybe, who knows? We'll shift tab again. Blank, our right. sponsors there we go. list five items. Blank, blank, workshops. Cool, okay, so that stuff wasn't there before. Obviously that link I clicked injected this menu. Um, but it's right at the top of the source order. And that's really counterintuitive, right? I would expect anything that's injected to come after the control that activated that. And I would expect some sort of indication that the link did something. And I would like some indication of what the link is going to do. And in fact, it's not a link that takes me anywhere, right? It doesn't, I don't go anywhere. All it does is present some content on the page that wasn't there previously. And presumably, when I l l hit it again, it gets rid of it, right? And um, so for that reason, it's really a button, right? So let's, I, let's make it a button. So here's one I prepared Lake earlier. Image. New Zealand PHP conference. So I let I risk. There we go. Well, it crisp, yeah. Uh, I've added um, a focus indicator, um, but I also um, tweaked the, the JS a little bit on this. So listen closely when we tab to the, that link now. Menu, collapsed button. Cool. So what I've done in this case. Menu uh, eight items, open a link, a new tab. Voice over off. I'll just turn voice over off. Actually, let's, um, let's look at this one. I like Firebug um, in Firefox a little better. Um, let's see if I can get this up. Oh, now I have to zoom in, don't I? There we go. Um, and we'll just make sure we find that. All right, so what you can see is I've added, I've added some aria on this link. I've added role equals button. So that tells the assistive, the, the, assistive uh, or the accessibility API that this is no longer a link, it's a button. So that's why it announced it as a button. Um, it's aria expanded is set to false because um, the state of the other bit of content that it controls, which I've referred to using the aria controls attribute, mobile menu is the ID ref of that container for the menu. Um, and I've added aria label menu because you'll see that in fact this is an empty link, right? There's nothing, there's a span in there and that span um, is using where are, Where are you? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, no, that's, it's, well, it's empty. There's nothing in it, right? It's using some CSS to create the, the hamburger, the, the three lines. Um, and so basically, we have an empty link. What is a screen reader to tell you about an empty link? Well, it looks at the href. The href is nothing but a hash. So it says slash in this case, right? Um, NVDA, um, by contrast. Um, gives you the base URL for the website because that's effectively what the location of a, of a hash is, I mean, of, of, a, of a pound sign, right? If it's nothing but a pound sign, it's basically saying it's a frag ID on this page. Um, so some simple addition of some ARIA there gets us all this way there, it gives us all the semantics such that I know what is going on when I get to that, that link. So let's... Um, Let's play with it. Oops, sorry. Voice over off. No. Nope. Voice over on. Safari. 
New Zealand PHP Conference 2.0. Share. Show all. Leaving toolbar. Okay, there we are. Link. Next image. One. New menu. Collapse button. I'll activate the menu button. Menu. Expanded button. So we got state. All the JavaScript did was when you toggle it, it changes the value of our expanded to true. And now if I tab, because I've changed the source order. Link. Speakers. List five items. Go right in there. Link. And I can just link, tab link, straight through. Link. Link. Schedule. Link. Menu. Expanded button. That makes sense. I expanded it. I can collapse it. Menu. Collapsed button. And it updates the state for us. So we, you know, we're totally informed, as much as a sighted user, of everything that's happening. Right? And I think with Michael standing over there, that, that's about all the time we have. That's great. So um, I'll be around for the rest of the morning. Um, so again, if you've got questions for Mick or myself, by all means, uh, do come in and ask us or talk to us. Thank you. Thank you.